Good morning. Um, I've got no disclosures, and I'd like to thank the uh, members of the General Thoracic Surgery Club to uh, let me present this morning. Um, just before we start, if I could just take a quick poll of the room. Um, how many surgeons in the um, room are offering TIF to patients at this time? Great. And then how many are, are doing links? Great. Good. Um, this, this, I, I kind of took an overview of um, an overview of this uh, talk to kind of talk about the, just kind of the general picture of links and TIF, how they fit into your practice and some of the other uh, issues with it. Um, we all know how bad reflux can be. Not only does it uh, cause a lot of uh, suffering on a day-to-day -day basis, um, we all see the end results of the inflammation with the esophageal cancer, and that's why I developed such a big foregut practice to try to head some of these things off. I think anybody that has a foregut practice kind of suffers and is frustrated by the amount of Nissens that have just dropped off over the years. And to me, this is a really interesting concept, not only worldwide, but in the United States. The amount of Nissens we're doing are, are falling off. And it's, um, it, it's, it's not necessarily because we've got new modalities coming in. There's nothing taking its place. I think there's a couple multifactorial reasons for this, um, why, why the Nissens have fallen off. One is, um, you know, at least in the Chicago area, I've seen that everybody tried to fit patients into one procedure, you know, mostly a Nissen. And maybe a Nissen isn't the best thing for them. The other thing I've really seen in, in our area is the lack of follow-up. I'm sure everybody in this room does a pretty good uh, job of following their patients for at least two to three years after surgery. A lot of the redos I see and a lot of the patients I, I've had, had to reoperate on were kind of one and done surgeries. You know, the surgeons operated on them, said, saw them post-op and that was it. And we all know there's a lot of um, problems uh, with that in the, in the long term. And what happens is the GI guy and the family practice doctor ends up managing some of your post-op issues and uh, you know you won't you won't get uh, another uh, consult from them. This is um, down in uh, Chicago in my local pharmacy. This is the uh, heartburn aisle, and uh, you know when you look at at the uh, pharma industry, this is an eighty billion dollar industry. Um, there's so much marketing going towards uh, proton pump inhibitors that I, I don't think some of the patients come in don't realize that there's alternatives to this. The patient perceptions of surgical outcomes are so driven. I mean, I, I've had patients come in more uh, upset and nervous about a Nissen than, they, than an esophagectomy for cancer. Um, they're, they're, they hear all these horror stories. There's Facebook pages where everybody gets on and kind of bashes it. And we all know it's a great operation, but, but patients kind of see the worst of things and, and they don't want what we're buying right now. Uh, they do want to see some, some other alternatives. And I think this is the biggest problem with treating reflux disease at this time is we really have a silo mentality. The way the surgeons look at this disease, the way the GI looks at this disease, and the way the family practice doctor looks at this disease is, is very separate in their practices and very rarely do we talk. And in my practice I've always tried to develop kind of a multidisciplinary team with uh, not only GIs on it but uh, dietary and nurse navigators to try to um, kind of have more of a collegial discussion around the process much like we do with lung cancer. So to get the heart of the talk, there's, um, I'm really just going to talk about TIF, which is transoral incisionless fundoplication and links. Um, that's going to be the uh, gist of this talk. I don't have any experience with Streta. It seems to be one of those procedures that comes on, falls off. Uh, Streta is uh, doing a, a, a ablation, really, of the lower esophageal sphincter. Nobody's really seen how that works, can document why it works. Um, it, it, if it causes fibrosis or just affects the nerve endings. Um, the company's gone out of business several times and then re be, re been rebought, and it always seems like it's trying to make a, uh, a, uh, a comeback. But I don't have any experience with it, and some of the results I've seen haven't been very good. Muse is very similar to the TIF, but instead of using a polyproline fastener, they actually use a stapling device to cr create the plication. And I, I have not used a Muse, but I've been told that it's a, a disposable device and it also uses some ultrasound guidance to build the fund graph. The uh, extraluminal uh, methods to treat GERD, we all know about the um, tissue fund applications, either partial or full. Um, I'm going to focus on the magnetic sphincter augmentation. There's a new device on the market called Endostim, which is where you play, plant two bipolar electrodes in the lower esophageal sphincter and uh, it actually goes to a pacemaker on the abdominal wall. And they can fine tune this through the office to kind of 
um, get, get control of the lower esophageal sphincter pressures and, and try to help with reflux that way. And then there's always a ruin wide gastric bypass. Usually that's your, your bailout for multiple failed reflux procedures, and I'm not really going to address that. So to start with the transoral incisionless fundoplication, it's basically an endoscopic repair of the GE junction. It results in a 240 to 310 degree wrap that you can kind of model yourself. The um, company has a new device out called TIF2, and it's a uh, it, it really, you have to be careful with that one because you could almost do a complete wrap. It really kind of lets you mold the tissue and, and, and take it around the GE junction. The company would like to lead you to believe that um, hernias up to three centimeters are reducible. I've got a little bias against that. Um, I, I don't believe that. Um, it's anybody, for any adult with bothersome GERD symptoms has a positive pH study, um, Hill grade one to two anatomy, and like I said, hiatal hernia less than two centimeters. There's a lot of contraindications to its use. Um, probably one of the biggest ones I, I really look for are osteophytes or limited neck mobility. Probably the scariest part of this whole procedure is uh, putting the device which rides over the endoscope into somebody's oral pharynx and getting it down. Um, the scope goes through this device. Um, the uh, working ends, I'll start with the blue part there, is the uh, retraction time. Once you get the scope in and retroflex the scope, that time goes into the squamous columnar junction and pulls some tissue down into that tissue mold. Uh, the tissue mold closes on it. When you apply suction to the scope through, those, through the black circular rings, it, it, it lets you manipulate the esophagus and push it down into the stomach. And then it has two H-type polyproline fasteners that go through. Like I said, the uh, scariest part of the procedure is just getting the device in somebody's oral pharynx and down into the stomach. Um, once you do that, I take a big breath and I feel like half the case is done. Um, I'll inflate the stomach with air. You advance the scope out through the device. You put that little tine into the tissue. You usually put in at or just below the squamous columnar junction. Pull it back into the tissue mold and then two polyproline fasteners go through there. In, when I first saw the TIF demonstrations like five years ago, I thought, this is crazy. I, I, there's no way I'm ever going to do this. And then I, I kind of researched it a little bit more and looked at it. And if you look at those last two pictures on here, it kind of looks like that diagram. And that diagram is a picture of a Belzee from one of our textbooks of surgery. And when you look at the description of the Belzee and what we're doing with ink welling the esophagus down into the stomach, that's kind of what we're doing with um, the, the, this wrap. So anywhere where I've kind of feel somebody needs a partial wrap, I've kind of deferred to a TIF. I don't use a TIF as my, my first line of defense against GERD. I usually defer to a Nissen or a Lynx, but I have used Bel Belzies with, in people with dysmotility. Um, this is from Chris Fernando. He had a nice review of this. And uh, I, I think this is what I've kind of seen in my practice, that you can get roughly north of 60% of people off their PPIs. Um, it, it, I don't think it does a good enough job of normalizing the acid exposure as a Nissen but um, they, they have been uh, satisfied. Um, I'm just going to skip through that. In my practice, like I said, I tend to use a TIF in, in the patients that I would usually do a partial wrap. So somebody with dysmotility, somebody that has greater than 80% drop swallows and has a low distal contractile integral, which was really kind of that force of contraction on the esophagus. I usually like to use it in the atypical refluxers. That's a really difficult group to treat because so much of their t disease is set up by inflammation. It's not that high volume reflux with a bad valve. The valves look pretty normal. They get those transient relaxations of the valve and it kind of sprays like carburetor spray. And, and uh, so the, you already have a valve that's kind of in place. Sometimes a Nissen is too much for those people. It's too much valve, so I, I tend to use um, a TIF in those patients. And anybody who's had previous abdominal surgery that you know, has upper midline incisions for multiple surgeries before, um, I, I may defer to that so I don't have the headache of trying to get into the uh, abdomen again. Um, I, I think anybody with a hernia of any kind it should get repaired before I do a TIF. I just don't, I, I, I'd feel really uncomfortable taking a two to three centimeter hernia and trying to bring it down under tension. I just think that's a bad, uh, a bad option. Um, in my hands, what I've seen with my TIF patients, I've gotten better heartburn relief long term, two to three years out, than I have with my doors and toupees. I'm sure there's people in the room that love doors and love toupees. I, I'm just not one of them. And probably the best part of this procedure is it's a chance to partner with your GI colleagues and kind of build up that multidisciplinary relationship. Early on, five years ago, I did all my own TIFs, 
in the last couple of years, I've, I've switched to doing the parasophageal hernia repair and bring the GI guy into the OR and let him do the uh, TIF part. And, and, it, and it gives you a chance to, like I said, um, work, work, work with them. The uh, first case I'm going to present, I've got a few very short 30-second videos to show some of these things. It was a 54-year-old male, long-standing GERD, worsening heartburn. He's got all elevated all the way up to twice a day Dexalant. It wasn't helping. He had regurg, uh, globus. His GERD quality of life score was high, and so was his reflux symptom index score. Um, he had a sliding hernia, um, high Demeester score, and his gastroenterologist held on to him forever, and she finally threw up her hands and said, I didn't think there was anything we could do for this guy because he had a normal lower esophageal sphincter pressure, and he had ineffective motility. So she thought there'd be, there'd be no options for him. So what I did with him is take him to the OR. I, 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 I'm a big believer in the robot, um, so I, I, I did a parasophageal hernia repair with him and a primary pleural repair, and then had uh, GI come in and do the TIF. And uh, this is the first video. Uh, this um, the the advantages of doing the para repair at the TIF is you'll see I can you can take off the gastric fat pad and you can take down some of the short gastrics and I think it lets that fundus be a lot more mobile if you if you didn't do that. But it's just a standard repair. I'm just trying to get down that esophagus and get a couple centimeters down into the abdomen. Um, and uh, do a good curl repair. I do believe that that is a complex area. It's a bivalve mechanism, and I think curl repair is a big part of this. Um, and we'll, we'll finish this up here. And then the next video is going to show um, a, uh, what the TIF looks like before and what the TIF looks like after. So you can see a wide open esophagus that is with insufflation of air. Um, but there's really no apposition on that scope. I grade that as a hill grade two to hill grade three. And then after uh, the curl repair uh, and the uh, reduction of the hernia, this is what the TIF looks like. And you can get up to a three centimeter length of that valve. It's pretty impressive. There it is there in the corner. That's the same valve there. So you can see you've got about two, three centimeters of length on the scope that we can see, and uh, it, it does do a pretty robust job of getting the valve back. All right, we can go to the next slide, Frank. Thanks. So that patient was home on um, post-operative day one. Uh, usually they, they do go home. I usually do get a barium study on, on them afterwards, not only just to make sure I don't have any unforeseen perforations, but kind of get a baseline study for my future studies at one and two years. Um, this patient currently is off all PPIs at 24 months, very acceptable scores, uh, no dysphagians, 100% satisfied after, after surgery. The next device, and this has become my go-to device for, for reflux, has been the Lynx. And the Lynx is basically the titanium beaded ring with magnets that kind of augment the lower esophageal sphincter pressure. Um, it, 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 John Lippum's done so much great work with this. He's, made, he's had so many publications that really help guide the rest of us guys that are doing these. And uh, you know, this is a slide from his, one of his presentations that it really augments the lower esophageal sphincter. It preserves the anatomy. Um, it's more physiologic and it is reversible. Um, you, you can take these out and I've had to take one out. I've got a short video of that of what that looks like. In all the studies that they, they've had, they, they did pH studies afterwards and it does normalize the reduction in acid exposure across the board. When you look at heartburn regurgitation, the ability to get off PPIs comes down to around 85 percent um, and it, it's very durable. It's, it's, it's been a, a very good device to use. And I think that's where, where we got in trouble before is, you know, we, we all know that 25% of the Nissans fail at 10 years. It's a tissue device. So I think uh, the Lynx will have a big advantage there. The other big advantage we'll have is on the side effects. The side effects are much less. That dysphagia rate is nowhere near 10% now. We've all learned over time that doing Lynx, uh, the guys in the room will tell you that it gets a fibrous capsule around the Lynx. And if you keep that fibrous capsule pliable, it, they don't get long-term dysphagia. So post-operatively, what, what I've done with my patients and most people are doing is have them, have them eat something every hour. You know, we'll start these people on regular food the next day. They'll take a spoonful of yogurt while they're awake every hour or a handful of crackers, just something to get those beads moving. Um, the last case I'll present is another 54-year-old male. 
Um, he's had long-term heartburn. He had decreasing relief of PPIs. This guy worried me a little bit. He is a really anxious character. He had inflammatory bowel disease. Um, so uh, I did get a gastric emptying study on him, which was normal. They had normal manometry, a small hernia, um, high Demeester scores, and, and high GERD scoring. The only thing I do different when I use the robot, when I think I'm going to do a links up front, is that number one port um, right there, I'll move it up a little bit. Usually I have them all across the line like that, but I'll either move that port up there so at the end of the case when we size for the links, I can pull the instrument arm out, put the links, through, put the sizer in through there, or I'll sneak it in here up on the left side. I'll put a little five millimeter port in during the case and then be able to put the sizer through there. Um, in, in this video, this is another short one. You're going to see me dissect out the G junction, putting Penrose drain. When you put these in, you exclude the posterior vagus nerve, and um, and and include the right. Uh, that 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 in the few device erosions that they had, think that when they exclude that posterior vagus nerve, that they dissect a little bit too much into the muscle fibers and thinned out the uh, the, the tissue. Um, and uh, we can we can show this next video. I'm not really operating that fast. Um, just trying to speed this up, but just getting the, the hernia down. Um, once we free up that, that part, I'll usually do my curl repair first. I don't, I don't put, um, I don't use mesh unless I really torn up and got the peritoneum off the cruise. If, if I don't see the cruise teared with these stitches, I usually don't use plugets. Um, I think using that slip knot technique, you can get things down under a gentle amount of tension and get things back together. That's the sizer coming in. I'm using the Penrose to bring it around. You make sure everything's out of the esophagus. So the beads on the um, links go from uh, 13 to 18. So you size it uh, where it pops off and you usually put it in two to three sizes higher than that. And uh, once you bring it through, it's kind of buttressed by that posterior vagus nerve so it's not going to move. Um, if there's any doubt where the G junction is, I'll put the EGD scope in again and put the firefly on and, and, and uh, confirm the level of the GD junction. Um, the, the, probably the things I we worried about the most were the device erosions and, and what, if you had to remove these. Um, they do, uh, they are MRI uh, sensitive. If, uh, if somebody needs to have like an elbow MRI or a knee MRI, you can probably leave the thing in. If they've got a crack, crack of the Tesna on the magnet for like a cerebral aneurysm or something, you have to take it out. It's too much. They don't set off the detectors in the airport, but every patient has a little Lynx implant card so they can show that they, they do have it in. The device erosions, there's been five of them, or six of them I think now. Um, none of them resulted in an in a inpatient stay. They're all managed outpatient. Patients had a little bit of pain and dysphagia, so they put the scope down, they saw a bead, and they did a couple methods to get them out. They either cut that bead out on the inside during an endoscopy, came back a month later after the mucosa healed up, and then pulled the links out, or they just pulled it out with a laparoscopy and took it out. I've got a short little video here that you can see. It, it, I had to take one out. This is one of my first links. I put in, the girl had recurrent symptoms at three years, and I think in the beginning they told us don't dissect a lot, don't just do a minimal dissection, and I think we missed a lot of sliders, and I think that's what happened in her. Um, she developed symptoms after two years, so I talked to John Lipham about it, and he, he said just take it out, and I actually resized it and put one, one in right after this, but the bigger part was I repaired the curl and repaired the sliding hernia she had. But it wasn't bad to get out once you get that first bead. And with the robot, the advantage is you don't have to cut the wire. You can actually grab the link and pull it apart again and, and, and get it together. So in my practice, when, we, when they uh, initially told us don't address significant hernias, um, you know, I, I, I used it very sparingly because like, like you guys, you know, that wasn't my practice. I didn't see the young person with no hernia or anything, but, but uh, you know, that's, that's where we used most of them. Now it's been my go-to tool. I, I used it on my giant parasophageal hernia repairs. I mean, Lipham's uh, in that paper, his recurrence rate of those are 8% with the links in place. Um, I use it on the giants. It's been a bailout for when you get that water bottle stomach that's just so scarred in. You know, there's really no fundus to wrap around. 
you know, and you're either faced with trying to do a collis, some kind of lengthening procedure, or kind of really torque a, uh, a wrap around. So I've used it for that. When I've done some open repairs, either through the abdomen or the chest, um, I've actually sized them and put them in open and had good success. I've used it after failed Nissens. I actually had one case where we did a, ro I did a combined case with general surgery where we did a, a the lady had a giant parasophageal hernia and a gist tumor. I sat down at the console, took the hernia down, fixed the crura. The general surgeon came in and uh, took the gist out. And when he took the gist out, there was no fundus of that stomach left. So I was kind of looking at this, go, well, I do nothing or I size it for a lynx. So I put a lynx on her and uh, she's six months out and has no reflex and, and is, is doing well. So um, bottom line, I think we need to be leaders in this and try to make this multidisciplinary care. And if nothing else, I think with uh, learning TIF and learning uh, links, it gives us one more tool to use for, for our patients. Thank you.